Hi, this is the next lecture on um, general physics. Um, this is part two of chapter 24 on magnetic fields and magnetism. And this is the video lecture for the lecture that would have occurred on Wednesday, April 1st. I hope everybody is doing well out there in TV land. Um, I hope that you're staying safe and that everything's going well for you. Um, I will be having, I will be on Zoom and I'll send you a Zoom meeting link for this afternoon between 12.40 and 1.40 uh, to answer questions on homework for Chapter 23. So if you need to do that, then you can just join me via Zoom. I'll just be sitting here in my office. But um, the next thing that we need to talk about is um, the force on charged particles and when charged particles are moving in the magnetic field. And so there are several different things that you have to consider when you've got a charged particle and it's moving in a magnetic field. Let's see if my computer will cooperate. Okay, so if a, if a charged particle is stationary, if its velocity is zero, here we've got um, a positively charged particle. If it's stationary and it's in a magnetic field, then the force on it is zero. The only way that a force will be exerted on a charged particle is if the charged particle has a velocity itself. Okay. If the charged particle is moving, but it's moving parallel to the direction of the magnetic field, so the vectors are parallel to each other, moving absolutely in the same direction, then there's also no force on the charged particle. Okay, So it's, if it's moving at um, uh, an angle, then there will be a force on it, and the force is only related to the perpendicular portion of the vector. Okay, So if a charged particle is moving um, to an angle, it does experience a force, and the force is perpendicular to the velocity and also to the magnetic field. So it's going to if you can imagine that you have a plane where you have the magnetic field operating in one direction and then an angle between the magnetic field and the velocity, then that will give you the force, and the force will be perpendicular to both of those in that imaginary plane. Okay? If the particle is moving faster, then the force is greater, and um, or if you increase the magnitude of charge, that will cause the force to become greater. Okay, and the force is greatest if the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field and the velocity are acting at 90 degrees from each other, then you'll have the greatest force. Okay, and so you use what's called the right hand rule. We're doing the right hand rule one more time. And so you take your thumb, and your thumb is a velocity. Your index finger is the magnetic field. Okay, and the force acting on that will be indicated by the direction that your middle finger sticks up. Okay, don't flip off your neighbor, um, but this just gives you a visualization, visualization. Make sure you're using your right hand, so that will tell you the direction in which the force is going. So you need to make sure your thumb is the velocity, your index finger is the magnetic field direction, and then the force will be sticking uh, the same direction as your middle finger. Okay, so if you flip them around, then your middle finger is going to go down, but if you, or the way the figures are oriented here, then the figure goes up. Okay. So this is the right-hand rule for a force on a charged particle moving in a magnetic field. And so the magnitude of the force is equal to the charge times the velocity times the magnetic field in Tesla, times sine of the angle. That's the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. Okay, and then for direction, you use the right-hand rule. Okay, so that's for a charged particle moving in a magnetic field. So now let's look at the right-hand rule for something else. Okay, so here... Um, This is a little different. 
trying to get oriented here. So here you have your magnetic field and your velocity. So your velocity is your thumb, your magnetic field is your index finger, and now with a positively charged particle, then that force is going to act down. Okay, so you just use the right hand rule, look away the direction that your middle field figure is pointing, and that's pointing down. Now, if it's an opposite charge, a negative charge, then you need to reflect that, and the force is going to go in the opposite direction. It's going to be opposite of that predicted by the right hand rule. Okay, so the magnitude of the force you, is given by our force equation. Okay, so that's not a vector quantity. You have to use the right hand rule in order to specify the vector. Okay, so let's look at our example. So we have the sun, and it emits a stream of charged particles that move towards the Earth at very high speeds. Okay, and let's say we have a proton that's moving towards the equator of the Earth at a speed of 500 kilometers per second. Okay, the strength of the magnetic field uh, of the Earth, we're assuming is 5 times 10 to the negative 5th Tesla, okay, and that is going to point north, okay, that's going to point from the south magnetic pole to the north magnetic pole, so that points north, and so what we want to do is we want to find the direction and the magnitude of the force on the proton, okay, so I'll get a pause on my video, and then we'll go over to our dock cam, and we'll bring up our equations. Let's move back, however, Okay, so our magnitude of our force is our charge times our velocity uh, times our magnetic field strength times sine alpha. Okay, and so we need to figure out those quantities. Okay, so we go back to our example, and let's just give this a try. Okay, so here we go. We have a particle, and it's a proton. Q is equal to positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Okay. We have its velocity. V is equal to 500 kilometers per second. So that equals 500,000. Okay. Yeah, 500,000 meters per second. Okay, right, focus, stop it, focus, okay. Then we have our magnetic field, and that is equal to 5 times 10 to the negative 5th Tesla, and the velocity is towards the equator, okay, so that's moving down. Charge is positive, so we've got that indicated, and then the magnetic field is heading north. Okay, so we can say that because the particle is moving towards the equator, okay, so that's down, particle is my thumb, so that's moving towards the equator, so that's down. Magnetic field is moving north, okay. So if we're going down and north, then the resultant force is going to be my middle finger, and that is going to be going along the equator. So if we get oriented, let's draw it over here, here's the surface of the Earth. Okay, it kind of curves. Velocity. is down, magnetic field is going north, okay, so this is along the line of the equator here, so velocity down, magnetic field north, since they're perpendicular to each other, then the alpha is equal to 90 degrees, okay, 
And if we're using our right hand rule with our velocity going down and we're heading north, then actually what would be happening is the vector for the force would be heading east. So F goes east. Try that out using a right hand rule. It's a little tricky to do that. Actually, it's more than a little tricky. Um, so go ahead and try that out with the right hand rule. Um, and we can talk about this more as you're solving homework next week. Okay. And then we know that our force is equal to Q times our velocity times our magnetic field times sine alpha. Okay, so we have 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Our velocity is 5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And then our magnetic field is 5 times 10 to the negative fifth Tesla. Okay, so we put all that together. Okay, and I'm not going to do the dimensional analysis on this, but the force that you're given is going to be in newtons. And so when you get that newton force, So here's my calculator. I don't know if you can see that very well. We'll, we'll go ahead and try to do the calculation directly. There's a lot of glare. Come on, flip up, flip. Okay. So we get 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Okay. Times 5 times 10 to the 5th. Times 5 times 10 to the negative 5th. And that gives me 4 times 10 to the negative 18th newtons. And it's going to be going east. Okay, 4 times 10 to the... Yeah, you can kind of see it there. I'm getting oriented with my document camera here. Okay. Okay, so 4 times 10 to the negative 18th newtons. Okay. So then we will go back to... See what we got. Uh, where, where's my notes? Okay, so we know that the direction was east, and the magnitude of the force on the proton was 4 times 10 to the negative 18th newtons. Okay, so what's going to happen with this, which is really interesting, the particle. is that the velocity is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, so if the magnetic field is going into the page, and the velocity is perpendicular, then that's going to create a scenario where the a particle, assuming that it has a force on it that works inward, the particle is going to spiral. Okay, and the radius of that spiral is given as the mass of the particle times the velocity divided by the charge, absolute value of the charge, and the strength of the magnetic field. Okay, so it's always going to move into a circle around that magnetic field, and it may have another velocity component, but the particles will move in circles, okay, around the magnetic field. Okay. Like I said before, if a particle starts out moving parallel to the magnetic field, so it's absolutely parallel, it feels no net force, but the general case is where the velocity is neither parallel or perpendicular to the field. So what you're going to see is a circular motion due to the per perpendicular component of the velocity and then a constant velocity which is parallel to the field. So you're going to have to break down the velocity into two components. One is perpendicular and one is, uh, one is parallel to the field. The velocity perpendicular to the field is going to spiral and the velocity parallel to the field is going to go straight forward. So you get this helical trajectory. It looks like a piece of DNA, just a helix moving around. Okay. So if we break down our, here's our magnetic field that's going up into the page, or up, up the page, not into the page, excuse me. So then we have one component 
a velocity that's parallel, and that will continue on, and it's unaffected by the magnetic field. And then we have a component of velocity that's perpendicular, okay, and that component of the velocity is going to move in a circular trajectory. Okay. So, if we show the velocity that's perpendicular and we look at the top view of this, so the magnetic field is going towards us, then we'll see a circular trajectory. And then the net result of this is that if our magnetic field is moving up the page, then our parallel component will cause the, the particle to move up with a magnetic field that's going parallel. And then our perpendicular component will cause it to move in a circle. So the net result of, of a perpendicular velocity, excuse me, a parallel velocity and a perpendicular velocity is a helix. Okay, so let's take a look at our example again. So we have a proton and it's moving uh, in a solar wind towards the equator of the Earth, okay, and its Earth's field is 5 times 10 to the negative fifth Tesla. The speed, again, is 500 kilometers per second, and now we know that the proton is going to move in a circle around the Earth's field lines. Okay, since it's acting perpendicular, it doesn't have a parallel component, it's not going to move in a spiral, it will move in a circle. Okay, so what we want to know is how long does it take the proton to complete one orbit of that circle. It's not orbiting the Earth, okay, don't, don't get me wrong on that. It's actually orbiting the circle, okay, and so we need to find out what the radius of the circle is, first of all, and then based on the speed of the proton, then that will tell us um, how long it will take it to move of one complete or orbit, or to take one complete circumference of the circle. Okay, so let's switch over to our document camera really quick, and we'll do that example. And here's the document camera again. And the arm. There we go. Okay. So we know the force of this. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the governing equation first. Go page up. Okay, so our governing equation is our radius of our circle, is the mass of our proton times the velocity divided by the absolute value of the charge divided by the magnetic field. Okay, so go back to dot cam. And there's our equation down the line. Okay, right here. Okay, so we can go ahead and plug in numbers there, and that will give us the radius of the circle. Okay. Mass of a proton, help me out, is 1.67 times 10 to the negative, was it 27 kilograms? Okay. The velocity is 5 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. Okay. And our charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And our magnetic field is 5 times 10 to the negative 5th tesla. Okay. So that's going to give us our radius. So we go ahead and calculate that. Okay. Please do these calculations with me. Okay, here we go. So we got 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms times 5 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. Okay, divided by 1.6 divided by 19th negative 10 to the okay, coulombs divided by 5 divided by 10 to the negative fifth Tesla, and that gives us a radius of 104.4 meters. Okay, so we're not done yet. Um, this is the this is interesting, weird thing about physics problems, is they always try to get you to go one step further. So we know the velocity, and we know the radius of the circle. 
So one orbit is going to be one circumference of the circle. So an orbit is going to equal pi times the diameter of the circle. Okay, that's just one circle around. Okay, or 2 pi times the radius of the circle. So we can plug in numbers there. 2 times pi times 104.4 meters. Okay, so the orbit itself Okay, is 655.8 meters. Okay, so that's our orbit. So, we know that velocity here, move this down and go to a different scale, so I can do this in sequence. Okay. So our velocity is just the change in position over change in time. So we know our change in position delta x is just the orbit of that circle. So that's 655.8 meters. Okay, we know our velocity, v, is equal to 5 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. Okay, or 500 kilometers per second. So what we need to solve for is delta t. So if we do that, then delta t is equal to delta x divided by velocity. And we plug in numbers, so that is 655.8 meters divided by 5 times 10 to the negative 5th meters per second. And that's going to give us meters canceled, and that will give us seconds. Okay, and when we do that, So we have 655.8 divided by 5 divided by 10 to the 5th. And that gives us, not very long at all, 1.3 milliseconds. Okay, so it moves along very, very quickly. I mean, the moral of the story is it moves very quickly. Particle is spinning. And in order to uh, achieve the circumference of the circle once, then it just takes um, 1.3 milliseconds. And the circular pattern is the principle behind a mass spectrometer. A mass spectrometer can actually identify the mass of a particle by charging the particle first and then putting it through a magnetic field and then finding what its circular radius is. Okay, so, the output looks something like this. Obviously, something like hydrogen is going to have a very low mass. Uh, something like propane way up here is going to have a very, very high mass. And so, what you do is you ionize these particles. Okay, so they're ionized, and they're accelerated to a certain velocity. And then whatever radius they achieve, you know the velocity, you know the charge, and then the radius is going to be associated directly with the mass. So the detector down here is set at a specific radius, and it only lets particles of a specific mass go through. The magnetic field itself goes out of the page, okay, so you can use the right-hand rule, and you can show that it's going to bend the particles in this direction, and whatever the radius is, then that, you can use that to back calculate the mass of the ion, okay? But you need to know the ion's uh, charge, you need to know its velocity, and then you use radius to calculate mass. Okay. okay. Magnetic fields can actually exert forces on current as well. Okay, so a current is a moving charge, so you would definitely see a force. So if you have a wire here, if that is perpendicular to a magnetic field going into the page, okay, and then if the wire carries current, then the magnetic field goes into the page, then that charge is moving in the direction of the current, okay, so if we have our velocity as the charge, okay, and then 
the magnetic field into the page, then that would exert a force to the left. Okay, try the right hand rule on that. It will work. Okay. And when you do that, then the current, your thumb is the direction of the current, which is where charge is moving. Your finger, forefinger, is the magnetic field, and then your middle finger is the force that is going to be applied to the wire. So if you've got a magnetic field, then you can actually see a force being applied to a wire. Okay, then the force that's applied to the wire is the uh, current multiplied by the length of the magnetic field, not its wire, but the magnetic field, and then the <coughs> intensity of the magnetic field in Tesla. Okay, so this will be perpendicular to the magnetic field. Again, if you're parallel to the magnetic field, the wire won't move. Okay, so let's look at another example problem. Okay, so let's say that we have a 10 centimeter wire. It's the same length as the magnetic field. It carries a current of 3 amps. And it's in a uniform field. The field's going into the page. And the field strength is 5 times 10 to the negative 5th Tesla. So this is just the field that's exerted by the Earth. Okay, so that's going into the page. So if we look at this, then you apply the right hand rule. Current is your thumb, goes up. Field goes into the page. Okay, and so the force on the wire is going to go to the left. Okay, that's going to be your middle finger that's pointing to the left. Okay, so we know the direction of the force. Now let's calculate the magnitude of the force. Get a fresh piece of paper here. Switch over my document camera. Okay. So here we go. So our current is 3 amps. Our field is 5 times 10 to the negative fifth Tesla, and our length is 10 centimeters, which actually also equals 0.10 meters. Okay, so we can just plug all that in. Force is equal to 3.0 amps times our length, 0.01 meter, 0.10 meters. Okay, and then our magnetic field strength, 5 times 10 to the negative 5th Tesla. And that will give us magnitude of the force. And that's out of focus. Let's see if that will work. Okay, so we're going to have to do this again. It's thinking about this. Okay, so then... So we take 3 amps times 0.1 meters times 5 times 10 to the negative fifth Tesla, and that gives me 1.5 times 10 to the negative fifth newtons. So not much. So that's my force. Okay, the force on that wire is not going to be enough really to move it. It's a thin wire, so you may see some movement. But if we can increase the magnetic field, this, this is a very, very weak magnetic field at this point. If we can increase the magnetic field, then we can get that wire to move. Okay, so let's go back to our notes here. Now, if we have two currents, then remember, mag currents create magnetic fields that rotate around the uh, current carrying wire. Okay, so if we have I2, the current that's going in one direction, it's going to the right, then I2 is going to create a current, or a magnetic field. B2, use the right-hand rule, and the current on the top is going to go out of the page, and on the bottom is going to go into the page. I1 is going to create a 
separate magnetic field, and, and below it's going to go into the page. Okay, so we have these magnetic fields, and we have perpendicular wires to the magnetic fields. So we're going to have two forces. There's actually going to be an attractive force on each wire, um, and that attractive force then will t cause these wires to tend to move together. Okay, if we have currents in the opposite direction, then the forces repel. Okay, and so the force on two parallel wires is just our uh, permeability constant uh, that is Tesla meter per amp, okay, times the length of the wire, okay, the length of the wire is going to be the same, times the current, okay, I1 and I2, divided by 2 pi, divided by the distance between the two current carrying wires. Okay, those are parallel wires, and the, that, does, that gives you the magnitude of the force. The direction of the force is going to depend on whether the current is going in the same direction or in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So now we have three wires. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we have three wires in one and three, the current is going to the right at 10 amps, and two, the current is going to the left at 10 amps. Okay, so we want to know the net force, magnitude, and direction on wire one. Oh, wow. Okay, so the net force on wire one is going to be associated with wire 2 and also associated with wire 3. So we're going to have to break down the forces. The force of, of, three, of 2 on 1 and then the force of 3 on 1. So let's go ahead and move over to the document camera. Okay. Okay. So I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and do this example and then I will conclude the lecture for this Wednesday. I've given you a lot of material, a lot of different examples, so um, we will finish up chapter 24 on Friday, and then I will assign you some new homework on Friday for the following week. Okay, so what we'll do, I'll go ahead and uh, finish this problem. So we have one uh, wire number one, that's 10 amps, Wire number two is two centimeters away. It's also 10 amps going in the opposite direction. So that's going to be a, uh, a cause of force up on wire one. And then wire three is going in the same direction as wire one. That's going to cause a force down. And what we want to know is what's the net force. So since these forces are acting in the opposite direction, then we can just subtract them from each other. Okay, so we go to the dot cam. Okay. So we have wire 1, wire 2, and wire 3. Okay, they're roughly parallel. So I'm going to focus. Okay, and then this is 10 amps going this direction. This is 10 amps going in this direction. This is 10 amps going in this direction. And each wire is 2 centimeters apart. Okay, so we have wires that are two centimeters apart. Then, oh my goodness, focus on me, please. Okay, there we go. Takes a while. So we know that the force is equal to the permeability constant times the first current times the second current divided by I go back? I'm going to go back and check the equation really quick. Okay. Make sure I'm getting it right. Oh, the length of the wire. What's the length of the wire? Oh, it's 50 centimeters. Okay. So I have to add that too. Okay. Times the length of the wire. So this is 50 centimeters long. Sorry. My drawing is getting worse as I go along. Okay, and that's divided by 2 pi distance of the wire. Okay, so if we look at the force between wire 1 and wire 2, 
okay, then that's going up, okay, so that's a positive direction, of course, wire 1 and 2, it's going in the positive direction, so we put in our permeability constant, 1.257 times 10 to the negative 6 tesla meter per amp, Okay, and then I1, 